Carla with Race to Walk, and today we're going to be talking about a book that changed the life of C.S. Lewis, which is Fantasies by George MacDonald. But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words, and on Tuesdays I upload videos about books, and then on Friday I host a live Bible study on Instagram Live at Race to Walk and upload that later here to YouTube. So if that sounds interesting to you, then be sure to like and subscribe so you can get update dates on notifications. So anyway, on with the book. Now, last week I did a video on the book that changed my life. And C.S. Lewis is, it's not, wasn't a book by C.S. Lewis, but C.S. Lewis is, is indirectly involved in that. So I thought that it would be interesting to do a video on the book that changed his life. Now, if you don't know who C.S. Lewis was, most people have heard of the Chronicles or Nar Narnia, either read the books or watched the movies, and so most people today are familiar with him from that. He was actually, um, he was born in 1898 in Belfast, Ireland, and he died on November 22nd, 1963, which is actually the same day that uh, JFK was assassinated. But he was a professor at Oxford University. He actually became more well known there, not so much as for, he became really popular for the Chronicles, but he became well known for screw tape letters. And then he was friends with J.R. Tolkien. He had a big influence on Tolkien actually finishing The Lord of the Rings because he wrote for forever. He was a member of the Inklings. And he is also considered, uh, I mean, there may be some debate about this because there were a lot of people rising up at the time, but you could possibly consider him the father of modern apologetics because, you know, around when he started his, his writings and his, his evangelistic efforts as far as the, his arguments for God, it, apologetics as a field really wasn't there and, and he was one of the people that changed that. Now there were a lot of people that were coming up with him at the same time, but he was, he was a very um, prominent voice in developing the apologetics movement. Now, anyway, so he was, if you don't know this about C.S. Lewis, he was an atheist for a good portion of his life, but he credits this book, Fantasies, which a fairy romance by George MacDonald, as one of the key moments in his life that turned him on the path to faith. Now, this reading this book didn't suddenly make him a Christian overnight, but it was it had a huge influence on him. Now. George MacDonald, not as many people know who George MacDonald is, which I think is just such a sad thing because I think he's an amazing writer. I, um, let's see, I have, yeah, I do. I have, this is, um, this is actually the same sort of copy that they had in my, uh, at my church library. And it says, this is how I came across my head, read the Chronicles of Narnia, and then I picked this up because, you know, it's a really interesting cover. And there was a quote by C.S. Lewis that said, I regard George MacDonald as my master, C.S. Lewis. And that's how I got introduced to George MacDonald. So I wrote, I, I read originally, um, he has a bunch of children's fairy tales, and then he wrote a lot of adult novels. But he was born in um, 1824 in Scotland. In 1850, he became a minister of a church in Arendelle. The Scottish Church was extremely and staunchly Calvinist and George MacDonald wasn't. So just imagine, look at a lot of the, um, most of the watchdog channels uh, on YouTube or even the blogs. They're usually Calvinists like always looking out for heresies, you know, and looking at little things to pick apart and, you know, to call people heretics. So just imagine that and the, uh, McDonald was not a, a Calvinist at all. So he lasted two years as a pastor and it came to a point where he just had to leave. So anyway, he ended up uh, leaving and he really didn't have a, a solid job after that. It was kind of like now we consider him as being a member of the gig economy. He taught, he wrote books, and 
uh, did small jobs just to make a living and to support his family. So he wrote these these children's um, children's stories. He also wrote some adult novels that he, he basically wrote to pay the bills. He wrote this fantasies in 1858 and it's actually considered the very first modern fantasy novel which when you consider that it makes it even sadder that not as many people are familiar with who George MacDonald is. Everybody should read. Everybody should read MacDonald. If not this one, another one. Now as I said Lewis was a, he was an atheist and um, then he comes across George MacDonald and the book Fantasies. And I'm going to read a quote by, this is Kevin Belmonte from an article on Breakpoint. It's called Mystical Light, C.S. Lewis's Debt to George MacDonald. <clears throat> so Lewis bought, bought the book and then Belmonte writes, The next few hours changed the young man's life. Indeed, it is not too much to say that the world might never have heard from C.S. Lewis in the way that it did were it not for his reading of George MacDonald's mythic masterpiece. I'm going to read C.S. Lewis's own words about that, that day when he found this book. So, and then on top of this, in superabundance of mercy came that event which I have already more than once attempted to describe in other books. I was in the habit of walking over to Leatherhead about once a week and sometimes taking the train back. In summer, I did so chiefly because Leatherhead boasted a tiny swimming bath better than nothing to me who had learned to swim almost before I can remember and who till middle age and rheumatism crept upon me was passionately fond of being in water. But I went in winter too to look for books and to get my hair cut. The evening that I now speak of was in October. I and one porter had the long timbered platform of Leatherhead stationed to ourselves. It was getting just dark enough for the smoke of an engine to glow red on the underside with the reflection of the furnace. The hills beyond the Dorking Valley were of a blue so intense as to be nearly violet, and the sky was green with frost. My ears tingled with the cold. The glorious weekend of reading was before me. Turning to the bookstall, I picked out an every man in a dirty jacket. Fantasies, a fairy romance, George MacDonald. Then the train came in. I can still remember the voice of the porter calling out the village names, Saxon and Sweet as a Nut, Bookham, Effingham, Horsley Train. That evening I began to read my new book. The woodland journeys in that story, the ghostly enemies, the ladies both good and evil, were close enough to my habitual imagery to lure me on without a, the perception of a change. It is as if I were carried sleeping across the frontier, or as if I had died in the old country and could never remember how I came alive in the new. For in one sense, the new country was exactly like the old. I met there all that had already charmed me in Mallory, Spencer, Morris, and Yeats. But in another sense, all was changed. I did not yet know, and I was long in learning, the name of the new quality, the bright shadow that rested on the travels of Andodos. I do now. It was holiness. For the first time, the song of the siren sounded like the voice of my mother or nurse. Here were the old wives' tales. There was nothing to be proud of in enjoying them. It was as though the voice which had called to me from the world's end were now speaking at my side. It was with me in the room, or in my own body, or behind me. If, if it had once eluded me by its distance, it now eluded me by proximity, something too near to see, too plain to be understood on this side of knowledge. It seemed to have been always with me. If I could have ever turned my head quick enough, I should have seized it. Now for the first time, I felt that it was out of reach, not because of something I could not do, but because of something I could not stop doing. If I could only leave off, let go, unmake myself, it would be there. Meanwhile, in this new region, all the confusions that had hitherto to perplex my search for joy were disarmed. There was no temptation to confuse the scenes of the tale with light that rested upon them, or to suppose that they were put forward as realities, or even to dream that if they had been realities, and if I could read the woods where Anodos journeyed, I should therefore come a step nearer to my desire. 
yet at the same time, never had the wind of joy blowing through any story been less separable from the story itself, where the god and the Eidolon were most nearly one that there was the least danger of confounding them. Thus, when the great moments came, I did not break away from the woods and cottages that I read of to seek some bodiless light shining beyond them, but gradually, with a swelling continuity, like the sun at mid-morning burning through a fog, I found the light shining on those woods and cottages and then on my own past life, and on the quiet room where I sat, and on my old teacher where he nodded above his little Tacitus. For I now perceive that while the air of the new region made all my erotic and magical perversions of joy look like sordid trumpery, it had no such disenchanting power over the bread upon the table or the coals in the grate. That was a marvel. Up till now, each visitation had joy, of joy had left the common world momentarily a desert. The first touch of the earth went nigh to kill. Even when real clouds or trees had been the material of the vision, they had been so only by reminding me of another world that I did not like the return to ours. But now I saw that the bright shadow coming out of the book into the real world and resting there, transforming all the common things and yet itself unchanged, or more, ac more accurately, I saw the common things drawn into the bright shadow. In the depths of my disgraces, in the then invincible ignorance of my intellect, all this was given me without asking, even without consent. That night my imagination was, in a certain sense, baptized. The rest of me, not unnaturally, took longer. I had not the faintest notion of what I had let myself into by buying fantasies. And this is from his autobiography, Surprised by Joy. Um, it does. This is an anthology, but you can get the individual book as um, a standalone book too. What's interesting about it is that when he talks about this book later, and I'll, I'll read part of it, he says that the writing itself isn't necessarily that great, but there's, I mean, not that it's bad. It's just he says it's not like it's not a masterpiece. But what is in it? The you know he talks about this joy shining through this holiness. There's there's a um, a sort of purity to it that that it it changed it, it literally changed the course of his life the trajectory it didn't he had said he was starting to go down a dark path and this this changed his direction so I'm gonna read a little bit more from his autobiography um, he, and again he compares this he's talking about what what impacted him about this book. A little later in his autobiography, he also talks about coming across G.K. Chesterton, which had a huge influence on him, and he writes, um, It was here I first read a volume of Chesterton's essays. I had never heard of him, and I had no idea of what he stood for, nor can I quite understand why he made such an immediate conquest of me. Um, then a little bit later, he says, um, Moreover, as strange as it may seem, I liked him for his goodness. And then he writes a little later, in reading Chesterton, as in reading MacDonald, I did not know what I was letting myself in for. A young man who wishes to remain a sound atheist cannot be too careful of his reading. There are traps everywhere, Bibles laid open, millions of surprises, as Herbert says, fine nets and stratagems. God is, if I may say it, very unscrupulous. So this is, and, and the thing is about, you have to remember about this, is that especially like in today's publishing, Christian publishing, um, people don't consider a book Christian unless if it literally talks about the Bible or Jesus and redemption. This has nothing, this has n nothing in it like that. It's just talking about um, what, you know, the reality versus the facade, you know, looking for truth and actual goodness. C.S. Lewis put together a a collection, a 365-day reading out of the writings of George MacDonald, and he wrote um, in here, he writes a little bit more about MacDonald and his writing. Here he's giving a little bit more of a um, critical observation of MacDonald, and he writes, 
In making these extracts, I have been concerned with MacDonald not as a writer, but as a Christian teacher. If I were to deal with him as a writer, a man of letters, I should be faced with a difficult critical problem. If we divine literature as an art whose medium is words, then certainly MacDonald has no place in its first rank, perhaps not even in its second. There are indeed passages, many of them in this collection, where the wisdom and I would dare call it the holiness that are in him triumph over and ever, even burn away the baser elements in his style. The expression becomes precise, weighty, economic, acquires a cutting edge, but he does not maintain this level for long. The texture of his writing as a whole is undistinguished, at times fumbling. Bad pulpit traditions cling to it. There is sometimes a nonconformist verbosity, sometimes an old Scotch weakness for florid ornament. It runs right through them from Dunbar to the Waverly no novels. Sometimes an oversweetness picked up from Novalis. Now, Novalis was actually the writer that had a huge influence on MacDonald, actually. But this does not quite dispose of him, even for the liter literary critic. What he does best is fantasy. Fantasy that hovers between the allegorical and the poetic. And this, in my opinion, he does better than any man. The critical part with which we are confronted is whether this art, the art of myth-making, is a species of literary art. The objection to so classifying it is that the myth does not essentially exist in words at all. We all agree that the story of Balder is a great myth, a thing of inexhaustible value, but of whose version, whose words are we thinking when we say this? For my own part, the answer is that I am not thinking of anyone's words. No poet, as far as I know or can remember, has told this story supremely well. I am not thinking of any particular version of it. If the story is anywhere embodied in words, that is almost an accident. What really delights and nourishes me is a particular pattern of events which would equally delight and nourish if it had reached me by some medium which involved no words at all, say, by a mime or a film. And I find this to be true of all such stories. When I think of the story of the Argonauts and praise it, I am not praising Apollonius's Rhodius's, whom I never finished, nor Kingsley, whom I have forgotten, nor even Morris, though I consider his version a very pleasant poem. In this respect, stories of the mythic type are at the opposite pole from lyrical poetry. If you try to take the theme of Keats' Nightingale apart from the very words in which he has embodied it, you will find that you are talking about almost nothing. Form and content there can be separated only by a false abstraction, but in a myth, in a story where the mere pattern of events is all that matters. This is not so. Any means of communication, whatever which succeeds in lodging those events in our imagination, has, as we say, done the trick. After that, you can throw the means of communication away. To be sure, if the means of communication are words, it is desirable that a letter which brings you important news should be fairly written. But this is only a minor convenience, for the letter will, in any case, go into the waste paper basket as soon as you have mastered its contents, and the words those of Lemper would have done are going to be forgotten as soon as you have mastered the myth. In poetry, the words are the body, and the theme or content is the soul, but in myth, the imagined events are the body, and something inexpressible is the soul. The words or the mime or film or pictorial series are not even closed. They are not much more than a telephone. Of this I had evidence some years ago when I first heard the story of Kafka's castle related in a conversation and afterwards read the book for myself. The reading added nothing. I had already received the myth, which was all that mattered. And I... I think that um, his point about the patterns that we see these these repeated patterns as stories is important and it helps connect us to history and also helps us identify meaning. Now um, about a couple months ago when I did my back to school book haul and one of the books was on King Lear, I was, I was just reading some commentary and I came across a uh, an article on uh, a response on Quora from a um, from someone who was talking about King Lear, 
who said that the storyline was horrible, there was no meaning to it, and the only value in Shakespeare was in the sound of the words, which is so ridiculous. It wasn't even true. I, I couldn't even believe that someone would write that. And the saddest thing about that was that the person writing it was a high school teacher. So he's actually teaching kids that there is no meaning here. I mean, and then we wonder, we wonder why we have this generation that is, you know, searching so desperately for meaning. Well, part of it's because, you know, they, they've been taught that there isn't any, that there is no meaning. They don't know how to identify it because they don't see it when it's right in front of them. Anyway, that's just a side note. But going back to the George MacDonald, um, in this, I, I was looking through this, I was just flipping through, I, I can't remember if I've actually read this or not, I bought the book, but I don't know that I read it, but he has, for every every entry, he has a, a title, and I just stopped because there was one here on uh, reading 331 that is How to Become a Dunce. And this is an excerpt from his George MacDonald's novel, Star Gibby. Naturally capable, he had already made of himself a rather dull fellow, for when a man spends his energy on appearing to have, he is all the time destroying what he has, therein the very means of becoming what he desires to see. If he gains his end, his success is his punishment. So we could apply that to today's selfie obsessed culture and all this posturing on social media couldn't we um, and then he also has another one titled the same thing how to become a dunce on number 344 and this is from the princess and curdy and in this one he writes a beast does not know that he's a beast and the nearer a man gets to being a beast the less he knows it and that's one of his children's fairy tales. So you can see he has some really, really deep themes in all of his writing. So in other other parts of uh, Lewis's writing, he's, he mentioned that he has, everything he's written, you can find elements of George MacDonald in there. And, and when I was going over fantasies again, I just recently read um, A Pilgrim's Regress by C.S. Lewis and going over fantasies again I can see how those elements are and how it was really inspired by fantasies but I've mentioned his C.S. Lewis's book The Great Divorce a couple of times and this is a story about taking a bus ride from purgatory it's, it's a little bit of a weird concept but it's really it's really interesting and in Lewis's story the a significant person from your life comes and meets you to guide you in and for him you can see how much of an impact George MacDonald had on him not only as a writer but spiritually you can see that he regarded him George MacDonald as his spiritual father and in The Great Divorce um, George MacDonald is a person that comes to meet him so he writes this is in chapter 9 and he's like he says, where are you going, said a voice with a strong Scotch accent. I stopped and looked. The sound of the unicorns had long since died away, and my flight had brought me to open country. I saw the mountains where the unchanging sunrise lay, and the foreground two or three pines on a little knoll, some large smooth rocks and heather. On one of the rocks sat a very tall man, almost a giant with a flowing beard. I had not yet looked at one of the solid people in the face. Now when I did so, I discovered that one sees them with kind of a double vision. Here was an enthroned and shining God whose ageless spirit weighed upon mine like a burden of solid gold, and yet at the very same moment, here was an old weather-beaten man, one who might have been a shepherd. Such a man as tourists might think simple because he is honest and neighbors think deep for the same reason. His eyes had the far-seeing look of one who has lived in long, open, solitary places, and somehow I divined the network of wrinkles which must have surrounded them before rebirth had washed him in immortality. I, I don't quite know, said I. He can sit and talk with me then, he said, making room for me on the stone. I don't know you, sir, said I, taking my seat beside him. My name is George, he answered, George MacDonald. Oh, I cried, then you can tell me 
You at least will not deceive me. Then, supposing that these expressions of confidence needed some explanation, I tried trembling to tell this man all that his writings had done for me. I tried to show how a certain frosty afternoon at Leatherhead Station, when I first bought a copy of Fantasies, being then about sixteen years old, had been to me what the first sight of Beatrice had been to Dante. Here begins the new life. I started to confess how long that life had delayed in the region of imagination merely, how slowly and reluctantly I had come to admit that his Christendom had more than an accidental connection with it, how hard I had tried not to see that the true name of the quality which first met me in his books is holiness. He laid his hand on mine and stopped me. Son, he said, your love, all love, is of an inexpressible value to me. But it may save precious time. Here he suddenly looked very scotch. If I inform you that I am already well acquainted with these bio biographical details, in fact, I have noticed that your memory misleads you in one or two particulars. So then the, the book continues on, and, and MacDonald is his guide as he goes in further into... Um, heaven. So anyway, that's my overview of um, C.S. Lewis, Fantasies, and George MacDonald. And I just, I think it's such an amazing thing about how God can touch us. He can use anything, anything, and how he can, he can inspire a story and just gently lead us and in, in closer to him. So if you have had a book that's, that's changed your life or made a, a huge difference, in, especially in your spiritual walk, I'd love to hear about it. Um, if you aren't already subscribed, be sure to like and subscribe so you get notifications of, of new videos. And thanks for joining me, and I will see you next time.